It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the special event celebrating the launch of the second edition of Minnesota's Natural Heritage, the definitive volume on our state's natural history and ecology published by the University of Minnesota Press, our co-host this evening. My name is Denise Young and I'm the executive director of the Bell Museum. We are so proud to be Minnesota's State Natural History Museum, a place where visitors can ignite their curiosity and wonder about the natural world, explore their connections to nature and the universe, and be inspired to create a better future for our world. Tonight, through conversation with the book's authors, we will explore Minnesota's diverse ecosystems and beautiful landscapes, our lakes and rivers, forests and prairies, farmlands and wetlands, and learn how those ecosystems have changed over the last 25 years. In doing so, we must remember that these lands were first inhabited by indigenous peoples. As a museum that aims to advance our collective understanding of both land and sky, I would like to acknowledge that the Bell Museum sits on the traditional and treaty lands of the Dakota people. I would also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, traditional keepers of the lands to the north. Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Bell honor that knowledge, the values embedded in it, and the people who keep it. In just a few moments, I'll be turning it over to our special moderator and Bell Community Advisory Board member, Dr. Mark Seeley, to introduce and converse with our panel of authors, all of whom I might add, have special uh, and personal connections to the Bell Museum. And finally, I want to note that this evening's event is bittersweet because we are missing Dr. John Tester, ecologist, naturalist, longtime friend of the Bell Museum, and the original author of Minnesota's Natural Heritage. John died in November of 2019 and leaves behind a long, distinguished legacy of research, environmentalism, and education. John's relationship with the Bell Museum began in the late 1950s when he was invited by then director Walter Breckenridge to help build temporary exhibits and begin developing a research program at the museum. Although his formal affiliation as a Bell Museum staff member ended in the late 1960s, John frequently engaged museum audiences as a guest speaker during public conferences and walkabouts of special featured exhibitions. Today, John's legacy, passion, and research on the biomes of Minnesota are ever present in the Minnesota Journeys Gallery in the museum, where we like to say that in the course of an afternoon, visitors can take a walking tour of the ecosystems of Minnesota. In fact, keen observers may notice some of the illustrations from Minnesota's natural heritage throughout the gallery. We are grateful that John's legacy continues on through this second edition of the book and offer our sincere condolences to his family, particularly his wife, Joyce, sons, Hans and Peter, colleagues and loved ones, especially those able to join us tonight. I would now like to turn things over to my friend, climatologist, meteorologist, professor emeritus, Bell Community Advisory Board member and weekly commentator on NPR's Morning Edition, Dr. Mark Seeley. Well, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, let me convey my personal thanks for being invited to participate in this tonight. Um, I, like so many at the University of Minnesota, had the privilege of working with John Tester. And uh, he was not only a terrific uh, faculty colleague, he was a, a fantastic person, someone that was very, very highly respected by the other university faculty. And I might go so far as to say cherished by many as well for his tremendous knowledge about the state we live in. Uh, it's, it's my task tonight to uh, talk with the three uh, wonderful authors that helped him with this uh, second edition of this book. They're all in their own right outstanding scientists and I might also add uh, outstanding people and Minnesota citizens who care deeply about our state. For those who've chosen to spend this evening with us uh, in the season of long nights and short days, I think you'll find it'll be uh, worth your time. Hopefully it'll be very informative, uh, educational, 
and perhaps even entertaining uh, for the next uh, hour to uh, hour and a half. So what we are going to lead off with, though, is someone, uh, one of the authors who is very familiar with John Tester, uh, both professionally and personally. So I'd like to introduce uh, John Mor Moriarty, who's a senior manager of wildlife, uh, been that for 17 years with the Three Rivers Park District. He was a natural resources manager for Ramsey County Parks and Hennepin Parks, as well as a community faculty member at Metropolitan State University. He's written five books on Minnesota natural history, including Amphibians and Reptiles in Minnesota, published in 2014, and A Field Guide to the Natural World of the Twin Cities, published in 2018. So with that, I would like to introduce John and ask him to say a few words about John Tester. Um, John was an emeritus professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Minnesota. He, as earlier said, he was a lifelong scientist and naturalist who witnessed many of the changes in Minnesota's ecosystems that are covered in the book. He's published numerous articles and research papers on wildlife and ecosystem ecology sharing his own experiences in a friendly style that gave readers um, an accessible, enjoyable article. Even if it was in a scientific paper, he still made it not dry like many papers of today. And whether he was flying over a bog in a Cessna or listing all the birds that breed in Minnesota, he offered dynamic insight into what makes these ecosystems unique and important. John received his bachelor's degree in wildlife in 1951 from the University of Minnesota a master's degree in forest wildlife in 1953 from the University of Colorado. He then worked as a research biologist for the Minnesota DNR before returning to the university to get his PhD under Dr. William Marshall in 1960. John stayed at the university for his entire career. He started as an assistant scientist at the Bell Museum, as Denise had mentioned earlier. Then he worked with Dr. Breckenridge in Northwest Minnesota on a Canadian toad ecology study, which was really groundbreaking in a lot of ways. He helped start the radial telemetry lab at the Cedar Creek Natural History Area, now known as the Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve. Many of John's 39 graduate students and postdocs had projects involving radial telemetry. In the early, John rose to the ranks to become a professor in the 1960s. In the early 1970s, John came up with an idea for a new department, which was ecology and behavioral biology. John served as department head from the beginning in 1973 to 1976. He also served as the director of, the Cedar, of Cedar Creek from 1984 to 1992. John was also a lead professor at the university's Itasca Field Station for many years, and it was one of the places he really liked to go and work with students and conduct field research. John wrote Minnesota's Natural Heritage, the first edition in 1995, near the end of his university career. The first edition has sold over 20,000 copies and stayed in print for 25 years up to the release of this edition. John retired from the university in 1998. John spent his retirement at the lake in a duck blind and becoming an accomplished wood carver. Writing a revised version of this book was not on his radar until about six years ago when several of his friends and colleagues, especially the three of us here tonight, convinced him that it would be a good project and that we would be willing to help. John was actively involved in the writing and editing of the book and got to see the completed manuscripts and printed it to the press in January of 2019. John did, as Denise mentioned, passed away in November of 2019. So he was a very important part of the second edition. Most of our meetings were held around this kitchen table. So it was a, a good way to, to work with John through this edition. Thank you. Minnesota is in an interesting position in North America. It sits near the center of the continent. And if you could go up in an airplane and look down on, on Minnesota and the central part of North America, you'd see the prairies or the plains landscape off to the west. You'd see the hardwood forest extending off to the south and east all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. 
the prairies going all the way to the Rocky Mountains or the Black Hills. And if you look toward the northeast and the north, you'd find the, the boreal forest, the northern forest with its spruce and fir and pines. And that landscape extends all the way north to the Arctic Circle. So Minnesota is at the, the meeting place, if you will, of these three major um, ecological systems. We call them biomes. The prairie biome, the deciduous forest biome, and the northern forest or boreal forest biome. It makes Minnesota a very interesting place because by driving just a few miles, you can find these 150 or so species of prairie plants Going in the other direction, you can find the 75 or 100 species of deciduous forest plants. And going just a few miles to the north and east, you find the boreal forest plants. So Minnesota is very complex. I guess I'll uh, amplify what uh, John had to say by simply saying, as a meteorologist and climatologist, Minnesota, also being in the center of the North American continent, is also a place where we see the collision and the interaction of almost every form of air mass our Earth's atmosphere has to offer. So it's a magnificent place to work in the field of atmospheric science or climate science as well. In fact, every time the National Weather Service has a job opening in the state of Minnesota, they are totally inundated by applications because everyone who's been trained in the field wants to come here because they know it will be one of the most challenging environments they could ever work in. Um, we're going to spend the next few minutes hearing from the three authors who've put these 10 chapters together in this new second edition and put a lot, a lot of hard work. Those of you that have seen the book know this uh, very well. And uh, the first author that we'll hear from, uh, Dr. Susan Galatowicz, has been a professor for nearly 30 years at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. She is the author of Ecological Restoration and Restoring Prairie Wetlands, an ecological approach. And she and her research team focus on wetland and grassland reef re restoration and invasive species management. I might also add that uh, Sue had a hand in terms of the formation and new initiatives at the Invasive Species uh, Research Center that was formed on the uh, St. Paul campus over the last several years. So um, Sue, it's your turn to take the stage. Great. Thanks, Mark. Well, it's my pleasure to be here this evening and talk uh, to you about some of the highlights um, of this new edition. Um, and I wanted to share with you uh, what my uh, my first page of the first edition looks like. And, and I'm happy to say I've got a really nice um, uh, message here from John. Enjoy Minnesota. It's a great state to be in. And that really captures sort of his spirit of his career and also what he meant to me as a, a mentor, as a young faculty member. Uh, when he signed this book, I had been on the faculty for two years, and he had uh, very generously uh, shown me around all of his favorite um, teaching spots within a couple hours drive of Itasca, since I was setting up a, a new course to teach there for the landscape architecture department. Um, and, and so as part of that process and in, in spending some time with him there. I also was a witness to the tail end of his um, writing of the first edition um, and, and his passion uh, for writing the first edition and also the challenges of putting such a, uh, an incredible work together. Next slide. The first edition um, has tremendous scope and detail. Um, and so when you're putting a book like that together for the first time, it's inevitable that um, that throughout time you'd say, well, maybe we could add this or what might be some extra detail that would be interesting. And so one of the first things our team did was think about what might we do to uh, fill in a few gaps, what might be some um, especially valuable detail. And when you, when you imagine us working together, uh, as John Moriarty noticed, noted, uh, imagine um, our team sitting around uh, John and Joyce's uh, table um, with some nice refreshments and having some 
a wonderful conversation. And I can tell you it was the most pleasurable book experience I've ever been part of. And some of the things we decided to, to delve into more in the second edition were some more details on the diversity of ecosystems. So including more detail, for instance, on savannas. Next slide. Or within the types of prairies, um, expanding out from, say, talking about dry prairies and exploring goat prairies like you see here in southeastern Minnesota or sand prairies that occur close to some of our lar large rivers. Um, and much of this was made possible, that extra detail, uh, because over the past 20 year, five years since the first edition, um, we have some incredible resources that have been developed by, uh, by programs such as the Department of Natural Resources, Minnesota County Biological Survey. And so we had sort of detail that didn't exist at the time of the first edition. So that's an incredible comprehensive view of our state's ecosystems. And it helped us tremendously when we added the details and specifics of, of those ecosystems. Next slide. It was also a good time to add more detail on the biology and ecology of invertebrates. You know, certainly insects are having their moment right now, but invertebrates in general are becoming better known all the time, like this basket fly, basket tail dragonfly of wetlands and ponds, and rare species like this winged maple leaf mussel, an endangered species of the St. Croix River, here displaying its mantle lure that hopefully will attract catfish, its larval host species. And so it was nice to add this, this detail to the already rich coverage of vertebrates and plants. Next slide. In revising the first edition, um, it also revealed and highlighted some of the important changes in Minnesota over the past 25 years. The second edition became an important way to mark those changes, some of them disappointing, like the mysterious decline of the Powashik and Dakota skippers, or the discovery of deformed frogs in 1995, short, shortly after the first edition. But there's also many good news stories of species recovery, for instance, like pelican nesting. Next slide. It's also interesting to note that most of the writing of the second edition happened in 2017 and 2018, as many environmental policies were being tested, especially at the federal level, and rolled back. So the second edition became an important opportunity to tell more of the people's side of Minnesota's natural heritage. I wanted to, we wanted to um, really think about making sure people appreciated what we had accomplished here in the state of Minnesota with our strong policies. We are fortunate to have peatlands and some prairies and wild and scenic rivers and forests statewide. Who were the pioneers of land conservation in Minnesota? Uh, people like Catherine Ordway, for sure, the namesake, namesake for this Minnesota Nature Conservancy Preserve. Next slide. We featured key policies as well, uh, as well as individuals. Um, we fe featured key policies that have been pivotal for land conservation and protection, like the Legacy Act of 2008, and the Environmental Trust Fund Resource Trust Fund passed in 1988, both of those by popular vote of Minnesotans. They've been crucial for supporting many of the statewide surveys of biodiversity and also protecting many of the lands um, that we share, cherish today. We don't want to take the conservation gains of the past 25 years for granted. Next slide. So we cover the, that, that conservation history in this new edition. And we also cover the tremendous uh, advances that we've had in reversing degradation of our ecosystems. And what are people doing to reverse degradation? How are we uh, restoring ecosystems and recovering species? So projects like this one in the St. Louis estuary near Duluth. Next slide. And certainly the contributions of citizen scientists and citizen conservationists. Because one thing that we certainly highlighted or became very clear in this book is that conservation in Minnesota depends less on a few charismatic individuals uh, than it does on basically uh, grassroots conservation from so many communities and so many people statewide. Next slide. 
and we covered certainly in the final chapter, especially some of the challenges that remain. And challenges are difficult to cover in a book like this that really features, you know, building awareness of the ecology of, of Minnesota ecosystems and landscapes, and also telling the rich story of our conservation gains. And those were some of the most challenging con uh, conversations, perhaps, for our team was trying to figure out, you know, basically what is the role of a book like this and highlighting the problems that remain um, and gauging their intractability. But we gave it our best shot and attempted a balanced analysis of some of these big issues uh, that remain for conservationists in the next 25 years. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, our next author uh, that we get to hear from is uh, Rebecca Montgomery. She's been a professor uh, for 17 years with the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. Prior to that, she had started her career as a tropical biologist before returning to Minnesota. Her research focuses on forest ecology and tree biology. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mark. And thanks everyone who are here with us tonight. I am gonna take my time and my remarks to just share some stories of how um, John touched my life and my career um, and how that led to my interest in being involved in making this revision a reality. Um, so long before I knew John and kind of unbeknownst to me, he was present in my formative years. My first field experience uh, was uh, in 1992, I was 20 years old um, in college and I spent the summer in Northern Wisconsin working on a timber wolf recovery project, radio tracking timber wolves. So using techniques that uh, John had been important in developing. And I did that work with a, a wildlife biologist from the Wisconsin DNR. His name is Bruce Cohn. And Bruce was really my first teacher of natural resources, of the ecology and natural history of the North Woods. And interestingly, I really lost touch with Bruce over the last many years. And last week, a message came into my inbox that said, it's been almost 29 years. And it was from Bruce. And Bruce had seen a article about the new edition of the tester book and saw that I was a co-author. Um, and he reached out to me um, just to reconnect and also to share the the story that he had as a student of John's and that John had been his favorite teacher at the University of Minnesota and that he had worked with John at Cedar Creek in 1966. So really unbeknownst to me, this first mentor of Northwoods biology had been mentored by John Tester. Next slide, please. Fast forward 15 years to the summer of 2004. I had just started at University of Minnesota. I was hired in July, July 1st, and was told that I, I needed to teach a Northern Forest field course in five weeks. Um, and as, as Mark mentioned, my background was largely in tropical ecology. And I thought, oh no, how am I going to um, be ready to teach a field course with a large component of um, natural history. Um, and up to this point, really, except for that wolf experience, I'd largely had tropical experience. So what did I do? I took a crash course by reading John's book, Minnesota's Natural Her Heritage. I used the book to teach myself and to teach my 2000 level course that first summer. And it set me on a wonderful path as a teacher here in Minnesota. And so I think of John as um, my, one of my early teachers um, of the ecology of Minnesota. Next slide. I first met John early in my time at the University of Minnesota, and I met him through a faculty dining club called Gown in Town. 
from uh, 2004 until 2019, I had the pleasure of monthly dinners with John and sometimes Joyce. And at one of these dinners, I asked John about the possibility of a second edition. And he said to me, do you really think anyone would be interested in that? Next slide, please. My response was that I thought an update like the first book would serve many people. Um, that we would continue to share these overarching stories, but update them with critical issues of this time and of the past 25 years, like our changing climate. Next slide. Like the growing movement of forest certification and shifts towards more ecological forestry and forest management. Next slide. Like the major disturbances that had affected uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, our kind of iconic crown jewel in our, um, in our Northwoods ecosystem, like the 1990 line blowdown and fires that followed shown here. Next slide. Like the change and the declining moose populations and alterations in wildlife. I felt really, I feel really honored to have been able to walk with John for a few years of his life and to work with him to update this book so that it can continue to inspire and teach uh, those who live here in this place that we call Minnesota and beyond. And with that, I will pass over to the next author, uh, John Mori Moriarty. John, the floor is all yours. I've already introduced uh, uh, people who joined late should know that you're the Senior Manager of Wildlife for the Three Rivers Park District. Right. Go ahead, John. All right. Once again, if people were expecting to hear the details of the book tonight, hopefully we'll get to some of those in questions. Mine's going to be more a story of how we, the time it took us to put all of this together. We actually started the process in September of 19, I went through the thousands of emails we've sent to each other. So in um, five and a half years ago, um, actually in 15, Sue, or Rebecca and I met with John to finally see if he'd be willing to start this process after a, both of us talking to him. We brought Sue on with, you know, within a month or so after that discussion and then started talking with Eric Anderson at the press. It took us a year to get a contract from the press and that actually put us on the course of having to write the book. We had a contract, we had to get it done. So between December of 16, and we'd already been starting a lot of writing until December or January of 2019 is when we wrote the book as Sue had mentioned. And so a lot of the revisions, going, re reading each other's writings, having the press look at it a little bit, we submitted the, the text manuscript in January 2019. They then sent it out to get reviewed and copy edited and things of that sort. From the time we turned that in, we worked with a number of people at the press to update the photos. A lot of the pictures that you've seen so far tonight have been new photos that were we had to find for the book. Um, we had to get new graphics. There were a couple of really good things about doing this book is the people that did the first edition were still around. So Patty Isaacs still was around to do the graphics. She still had the original graphics that she could revise. Mary Kirstead, who did the copy editing in the first book was still doing copy editing for the press. So it made our transition into, um, into getting the book complete good, but there's over 250 illustrations and graphs in the book and trying to put that together was a, a massive task. We were all very picky on making sure the photos showed what we wanted to. And Christian Tweeten at the press had to find new photos for us and go back and look for more photos. And I'm sure he's glad that this project is done. Um, so it took quite a while to get it done. The press finally got it ready to go into production started working on things. And then this March COVID hit and things slowed down. 
we were initially hoping that the book would have been out in October um, so we could beat the Christmas rush. But because of that, it took a little bit longer. And we as authors got our first copies in our hand on January 3rd. I picked up copies from Eric Anderson. So it was a long process. You know, writing, writing a book has many, many steps in it. Um, lots of questions to the press and to each other. So it's, it's really good. And in the writing, I, I have to say that most of the technical writing on updating the, the different habitats was done by, by Sue and Rebecca because they're both outstanding ecologists, especially plant ecologists. Most of my work is working with wildlife. So I went through and did a lot of the animal specialty parts, updated a lot of that. We had to change lots of names. Um, since taxonomists, the scientists that name plants and animals got DNA into their labs, they've really been rearranging a lot of, a lot of the plants and animals and names have changed, their relationships to each other have changed. So it took a lot of fil figuring that, that out in the book and getting that all up to date. So there's a lot of things that went on behind the scenes. Um, and then we worked with a number of people at the press, you know, to get the points and things done. And we've really, you know, I don't know, I, I think I annoyed them a little bit more than, than the others. One of my tasks was to kind of be the, the conduit between the press and the authors. So I, I worked on them a lot, but there was a lot of people at the press that did really good work. We had really good people that helped contribute photos to the book. Some are from the original edition, but the majority of photos are new photos and updated photos to, so we could show the, the new, new information that's out there. But there are some people on the, on the press that I really want to thank. Um, they're acknowledged in the book, but our editor, Eric Anderson, you know, was put up with us for, for those five years. And Christian Tweeten, the associate editor, was very helpful in getting all the graphics and keeping everything in line. Um, when they sent us the final thing that, for those of you that are into big files, just the photos and graphs were three gigabytes of images. So it, it's really a big, a big task. Then Oxner did all the production, got everything in line to get it printed. As I said earlier, Patty Isaacs did all the graphics for us. Um, Mary Kirstead did it, the copy editing, and then Heather Skinner has been helping us get the information out about the book and answering a lot of our questions here in the last stage as we, as we roll out the book. So they were really important to what we did. The Bell Museum has been very supportive of all our activities. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a really keen thing. And the whole Tester family to bring them back in have been really good supporters and cheerleaders for the work that we're getting done. And, and we really have appreciated you know, their friendship over the last, the last five years. So now I think we're gonna go into the, the questions. So I will turn it back to Mark. Thanks very much, John. Um, and, uh, and Sue and Rebecca, thanks for those uh, comments. I, um, for participants tonight, we're gonna spend just a few minutes on uh, some specific questions um, that I'm going to ask the authors to uh, answer, uh, hopefully uh, uh, with uh, a, little, a little bit of a tendency towards brevity so we can get to more uh, audience questions in the second part of this, which we'll have moderated by Denise. But uh, I'd like to start off first with the uh, question for all of you. What was the most important thing you learned in writing this book? And perhaps Sue, you could lead off. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, certainly so many things, but I think, I think one of the things I learned in doing this book was just how deep and broad the information resources are for our natural resources and the environment in Minnesota. And so almost no matter what topic we were dealing with, there had been comprehensive surveys from everything from, um, you know, certainly our, the surveys of our ecosystems to contaminant sites to, you know, all of the various oil spill incidents. 
Um, you know, I could go on and on. And, you know, many of those were funded by some of these recent policies that from like ENRTF, LCCMR, Legislative Commission on Minnesota Resources. And so we have such, you know, broad uh, information um, to draw on for understanding Minnesota's ecology and also for making decisions on its behalf. So I think that was one of the things that I really learned, um, you know, in areas that I was less familiar with, just how amazing our information resources are uh, for the for for our state, and and that is is really a remarkable thing. That's that's great. That's interesting too, and I wonder if that's partly unique to the culture we live in here in Minnesota, and the rich history of uh, research of our of our own uh, state. But Rebecca, do you have any comments on that question? Yeah, I guess for me, I was a little more reflective thinking about this question in that this book challenged me as a research scientist at the university to really think about how to tell the stories um, and, and use that voice that John really created when he wrote the first book in terms of um, writing for that broad audience, making accessible, making um, writing the book in a way that you know, would elicit wonder and excitement from the readers and kind of that wow factor um, that perhaps my my traditional kind of scientific paper writing doesn't reach a broader audience in that way. And so I, I feel like that was something that I learned was really um, working on what's important, what will people be interested in, how to tell those stories in a way that will engage yeah, very, very good. One of the first books I read when I arrived in Minnesota was How to Talk Minnesotan by Howard Moore. Uh, I think it's still out there somewhere, but it's got some good tips in it. Uh, John, how about your take on that question? Uh, mine kind of goes back a little bit to with Sue. It's just the amount of information that's out there and trying to decide what you put into one book. I mean, as you can see behind me, there, you know, some of us want to have all the information and, and end up with too many books. Um, but, you know, to try to fit everything into, into that one textbook and keep it so that there's enough detail to keep people interested is really a challenge. And especially when, you know, we, you're, we're adding more information. The book is about 120 pages longer than the first edition. Um, so it, it has really grown to put it, all that new information in there. So it's trying to, and that could have ballooned more if we weren't careful. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks. John, why don't we stay, uh, stay with you on the second question? I'm sure you've given some thought to this, but wh what do you want readers to take away from this book? Um, I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of really interesting habitats throughout the state and there's a lot of in the in a, ecosystems and they're very important to us as humans to sustain us within the state but also that not to say oh oh look at they're they're saying that we have lots of nice forests and prairies but in actuality there are a lot of the, the negative impacts the the fact that we've impacted a lot of the habitats the invasive species that Sue had mentioned earlier that I spend most of my career working on controlling invasive species. So there's room for the wildlife. So just so people know there are, there are issues out there just to that, I guess, without getting too long winded, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> sure. Sure. How about, how about you, Sue? What, what are your thoughts on that question? Well, I think what I what I would like people to take away from this book is, you know, as as John Tester uh, remarked on his signature of my first edition, enjoy Minnesota. It's a great state to be in. Um, get out, learn about the ecosystems of Minnesota, the ones you're less familiar with. Um, learn about the amazing plants and animals and landforms um, around us. And the more you know, the more you'll care. And the more you care, the more you'll participate in conservation and, and support doing some of the you know, tough work ahead of us. Um, and I think that that's what I hope people get out of it. It's, it's, it's worth the effort. Uh, we've got something special here. 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I hope a lot of young people get their hands on it as well. Um, how about you, Rebecca? I think I would echo Sue. I mean, my first thought on this is I want people to take away a kind of a sense of wonder and a better understanding and curiosity about the just really richness of what we have here in Minnesota. I mean, John's video at the start of this talking about these three biomes coming together and really the unique position that we have here in the center of uh, North America and what that means in terms of the, the world around people. Um, I hope this book inspires them to learn more and to get out and learn about the place they live and develop these connections to place that I think are critical for, um, you know, for the, the actions that will keep these um, wonderful beings and places uh, for us all to enjoy into the future. Very, yeah, I'm with you on that, absolutely. Uh, staying with you, Rebecca, on the last question before we get to participant questions is um, a little bit of a follow-up, actually, is among Minnesota citizenry, uh, where would, what, what audience for this book would you like to see particularly really get enthusiastic about it? Oh boy, you asked me particularly, I was going to say everyone. This book is for everyone, <laughs> right? It's for everyone. Um, you know, one of the things that I noted down and part of what really um, motivated me thinking about um, this second edition was my discussions with faculty at tribal colleges and community colleges throughout the state of Minnesota, where this book um, often is used in introductory classes on, on Min ecology of Minnesota, natural history of Minnesota, and them really saying, you know, is there going to be an update of this book? There's all these new things that, um, that they felt like this book could continue to be a tool to teach and, and inspire that next generation. So um, that's one audience that, that I personally see or that inspired me in some ways to think about um, keeping this book current so it could keep sure. playing this role of education. Sure, that, yeah, that makes, how about you, Sue? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with kind of a niche answer here. Um, when I think of who I want to for sure read this book cover to cover, I would say everybody in the Minnesota legislature, everybody on a land use and planning council, um, and every administrative law judge in the state of Minnesota who might render an opinion on an environmental law. Um, and, and I think that it's really important for our policymakers to understand what a deep well of information they have to draw on and how that can help them make the best decisions possible on our behalf. Boy, I couldn't be with you more on that one, Sue. That's, uh, that, that would be my hope too. John, you have, uh, I saw you agreeing with that. You have any additions to that? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I echo Sue very strongly. That was going to be one of my top ones. The other one is, the, you know, the, either community college or even high school. This book is not written for a bunch of science geeks. You want, you need to be interested, but you know, the one thing we're finding is fewer and fewer people are interested in conservation as careers. And if they could read a book like this and get excited early on, you know, they don't, you know, it, it really helps. So I think, you know, getting it out to the masses, um, you know, having, my colleagues all got a copy from me, but at the same time, they're not, it's great that they're gonna read it, but it's not gonna change their opinion of the importance of conservation and ecology in Minnesota. But if you can get you know, a few high school students involved and interested and get them involved in making this a career, I think it's gonna be really useful. So, you know, more, you know, high school and junior college students, but then also every elected official we have. <laughs> yeah, I, 
Yeah, I, when I think about scale in our own state, uh, having worked 40 years for University of Minnesota Extension and visited all 87 counties in this wonderful state, I would like to see this book uh, uh, as part of a standard reference library for all the people involved in local units of government all the way up the ladder. Mm -hmm. I think it would be uh, really, really a wonderful, wonderful asset if they all had it at their disposal, given that as we, none of us can completely digest a book like this in one read. It's a book you have to keep around. Mm -hmm. and you have to keep referring to. It's got so much good information in it. But, uh, well, thank you for answering those questions. Um, now we get to turn to those who have been uh, participating with us uh, this evening. And I'm gonna turn it back to Denise to uh, guide that conversation. Denise, go ahead. Great, well, thank you, Mark. And thank you, um, panelists, um, for a great conversation so far. Um, we have received several wonderful questions, varied questions um, from participants this evening. And I want to encourage you, if you have questions, to um, write those in the chat. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. So I think we're going to start with a question from Beth that is about the photos in the book um, and how contemporary they are. Um, and she asked that if we visited these landscapes today, would, uh, would they have... The, would those landscapes largely appear as they do in the book, or um, has a lot of time passed since the photos were taken? Um, who would like to take that one? Okay. I'm just going to stay unmuted for now. Um, I could, I mean, uh, most of them are contemporary. Some of the landscape photos are from the first edition, so they're they're 20 years old. But most of those are from areas that were protected. So. I think most of these sites you could still go to and they won't be subdivisions or potato fields at this point, but habitat has been lost. But we, like I said earlier, we had updated numerous numbers of the photos. Some of the ones weren't necessarily the best. It took a while to find the one that showed the, the logging operation with that green buncher feller machine. You know, that was a fairly recent one, not doing what, you know, we necessarily wanted to see with the forest, but, um, you know, we tried to update the ones that needed to be updated, but the habitats that were shown in the, in the book are still extant. Great. Thank you. Did anybody else want to add to that one? Good. All right. Let's get, let's go on to another question. Um, there's one from Peggy and she wanted to know um, if, is there an underappreciated region or habitat that Minnesotans should make an effort to visit? And Maybe we can just we jump right in. give our favorite, right? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I, I visited the Big Bog this summer and it is fabulous. And I recommend everybody to go check out the peatlands of the Big Bog and it's really accessible. There's a big boardwalk. So um, it's accessible to a wide range of people's abilities and it gives you a view right into the beautiful peatland ecosystem that I think is a real unique system to Minnesota for the lower 48 states. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Sue? Oh, heavens, I don't know how to pick other than <laughs> uh, I would say that, um, you know, just off, uh, just off the cuff here, um, you know, I think if we, we have such a sort of lake mindset in, in Minnesota, and I, you know, I was heavily involved in the aquatic chapters and I just want to make a case that really Minnesota is also a state of large river systems. And so appreciating the six large river systems that we have in the state and all of the amazing diversity that they hold. For instance, you know, we have incredible freshwater mussel diversity in our large rivers and incredible fish diversity. And so I think that's, a, you know, maybe one that um, we don't think as much about sometimes. And so I'd encourage everybody to, uh, get in their canoe as soon as the floodwaters of the spring recede and uh, head down a river. Thanks. And I John? would be in the opposite corner and 
most people, when they go on vacation in Minnesota, they go up north to the woods. And the prairies, I think, are underappreciated as far as a place to go and, and hike and see. Um, they get hot in the summer, um, so it is a little bit different. But, you know, as far as getting into the few large prairies, there's a few up around Moorhead area. There's a few big ones over in around Montevideo where you can actually get out in the middle of the prairie and think you're still, you know, pre pre-1900s or, you know, in the prairies, but there's a lot of really cool areas. You're going to drive through a lot of cornfields and bean fields to get to them. But I think the prairies, you know, I've probably been to Blue Mound State Park in Southwest Minnesota more than I've been to Tetagooch State Park in, you know, on the North Shore, which everybody tends to go to, so. Well, thank you all. Okay, next question here. Um, it's more an observation and perhaps um, one or more of you will respond to it. Um, Regina says that she noticed, uh, notes a striking difference in the preface, uh, prefaces written by Dr. Tester in the, in the two editions of the book. In the first edition, he hoped that this knowledge provides a basis for understanding Minnesota's ecosystems and that, and there's a quote here, such understanding will ultimately lead to their wise use. Um, and then she says in the second edition preface, his call was more urgent, recognizing human effects and stating, um, again, a quote, over the past 100 years, this landscape has been seriously disrupted. Um, and um, he talked about the pace of change that has accelerated, about current human population practices and an industrial way of life. And um, to this end, she is wondering, what kind of conversations did you have around that kitchen table um, about the change in tone and urgency of the second edition? Yeah, I'll, I'll just take a quick shot at that first. Those were actually pretty lively conversations. And, you know, he made it very clear from the outset that he felt some regret at not having a more hard hitting message in the first edition. And in some ways, you know, we push back on that a little bit, saying, you know, you really have to tell that you have to really sort of feature the ecology of the of the of the state or or that message would fall flat if it was it was mostly about sort of the of the threats because we do need to you know celebrate the natural history of the state as well as sort of uh, highlighting those challenges um, and that was a, a that was one thing he was you know editing editing our work for was challenging us had we had we made the threats clear enough that was one of his main filters. Um, on the chapters that Rebecca and I were, you know, delivering to the team. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to comment on that? I think over 25 years, he just realized that we were not learning fast enough to be careful. And, you know, we need to, it's kind of like people have been talking about climate change for, you know, 30, 40 years. The general public's only been talking about it for probably the last 10 or 15. And there's a big chunk of the general public that still is saying, oh, you're just all a bunch of fake newsers. Um, so, you know, it, it's gonna take a long time and hopefully by showing people there is an issue behind some of these problems and, you know, we need to do something, you know, people will do a little bit more of it. You know, he was, and I think we all, I mean, sometimes those discussions got a little spiraled <laughs> <laughs> downwards as we start looking at some of these issues, but. All right, thank you. Um, sticking with uh, climate change um, for a minute, there's several questions related to climate change. Um, one from Hans is, does the updated edition, does the updated edition include projections of the specific effects of climate change on our biomes and species diversity? And will we eventually lose some of our biomes and perhaps gain others? I can take that one. We, we for each of our the sections on specific biomes and ecosystems included in, um, in the new material, what the predictions were in terms of climate, um, as well as what the projections are for those ecosystems. So yes, the new book does include um, those those that new information. Both in the climate chapter actually was heavily updated to reflect the new information and projections, but also in the, the specific sections 
I don't know, Sue or John, if you want to talk specifically no. about any of, of the, any more specifics on that? Other than I think that what will be clear when you read the new edition too is, is the multiple stressors are a big part of this. You know, it's not only climate, but it's climate times, invasive species, climate times, habitat loss. And so a lot of times our status and trends and our sort of future, our sense of the future is, is colored by those, um, by those combinations of stress. Thank you. Um, question from Barb um, that I think gets to Sue some of your comments about the people side of Minnesota's natural heritage. Um, and she was curious, what Minnesota conservationists besides Helen Ordway do you feature in the book? And um, you also mentioned some citizen science projects and are there any that you discuss in the book? Um, boy, in terms of um, conservationists, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I'm kind of drawing a blank right now. And it might be because I'm a more, more of a morning person than an evening person. Um, <laughs> That's fine. I'm really sorry. About You'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> I needed to study our book more before I started this. Um, the citizen science projects, certainly things like the Loon Project and lake surveys. Um, and I think we even make a nod to some of the phenology work that's going on. Um, and, and certainly, you know, um, and certainly the, the citizens who are involved in sort of boots on the ground habitat work as well. So it's sort of filtered, uh, filtered throughout the book or uh, scattered throughout the book. All right, fantastic. Um, Rebecca, I think this might be a question for you. Um, what has the state of Minnesota done since the first edition of this book was published to improve sustainable forest management and protection? And how does your book describe these changes? Yeah, thanks Dave Zumita for that question. <laughs> I um, saw that earlier. Well, one of the things that happened soon after the first edition was the generic environmental impact statement on timber harvesting and forest management. And that is now covered in the book. Um, the advent and development of the Minnesota Forest Resources Council, which sets, um, as you know very well, <laughs> uh, sets agendas in terms of critical areas for research in terms of forest management, the review of how well the state was doing on the GEIS. Um, the Minnesota DNR um, in the last few years has, has cross agency um, mandates in terms of climate change and bringing those kinds of approaches into uh, their forest management approaches um, and decision-making. Um, those are a few examples that come to mind and I cover that. Forest certification, certainly. Um, all of the state and federal forests in the state of Minnesota are dual certified, I believe. <laughs> um, and uh, that is covered within the book, um, as well as really what I see a shift in the philosophy of forest management um, away from perhaps a, um, boards and cords plantation style to really more thinking about managing forests based on the ecological processes that are um, common in them and emulating those that, that variability that's natural there as part of the, the approach to uh, managing those forests for multiple outcomes. Um, so, um, I don't want to take up too much of the time going through this, but we updated those sections quite a lot to reflect uh, the, those, the, those changes within the forest management in the state. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, there is a question related to Native American perspectives. And um, in particular, how, um, how might Native American perspectives um, which have you know for a long time been overlooked, um, contribute to the revised edition, if at all. I'll give one example, a specific example. Um, you know, I think there there were several in the chapters that you know that I was um, leading on the the drafts, but one that stands out is the coverage of wild rice harvesting. 
which in the first edition was uh, really uh, limited to um, the, you know, the small commercial enterprises here in the state of Minnesota. And we expanded the um, wild rice um, and its um, and its use, uses by indigenous communities and connections to them. And so broadened that out significantly. And then also covered, you know, the recent um, issue of the of the sulfate standard on wild rice and how that played out. So, you know, basically expanding that topic out, which is a really challenging one um, and has some unmet um, challenges that we still have to deal with in the state, like lacking a sulfate standard. And so but in the middle of all of that is the incredible importance of wild rice um, to the Ojibwe uh, communities. All right. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, there is a story here from Terry. Um, it's a story about John Tester. Um, and it um, says that in the, in the 1960s, there was a large um, pontoon like barge boat um, on the St. Croix River. Um, and Terry and her father, Terry was a small child. And um, Terry and um, their father were in a small little boat with an engine that um, stopped working and the boat contained the, the barge boat saw them and um, it was University of Minnesota biology science students and a professor, um, Professor Chester, um, and they kind of rescued, um, they rescued the, um, let's see, Oh, I'm sorry. I got the story wrong. The barge broke down and the students, University of Minnesota biology students and professor were yelling and Terry and their father um, rescued the, the students. And um, I'm wondering if uh, I might combine that, that fun story of um, Terry and their father pulling this large, in a small boat, pulling this large boat down the river to another question um, about um, students and um, do you find that there's more or less interest, um, and this is a question from Leslie Thomas, in um, studying conservation and why do you think that, why do you think that might be? Well, I'm not sure there's less interest. Um, that's not, that's not clear to me. I, 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 up until a week ago, I was the department head of fisheries and wildlife. And, and when our undergrad numbers are up, I just feel like everybody wants to learn about this and our undergrad numbers are up. Um, they're, they're, you know, increasing faster than most of the other um, majors in our realm at the university. So I guess I would like to uh, use that as a, as an indicator um, that um, the, you know, generation that will be coming along as, as adults soon um, really are interested. You know, we have, we have four times as many um, students, I think, in the undergraduate major in fisheries and wildlife uh, today than we did, you know, um, 30 years ago. I might add that I teach a forest ecology course at the U and, you know, when students register for it, they see and groan that they have a four hour lab on Friday afternoon and they come into the class on the first day. And I know they're thinking, I have a four hour lab Friday afternoon. This is going to be terrible. And I take them to um, examples of all the, the different biomes of Minnesota in and around the Twin Cities mm -hmm. on Friday afternoons. And we walk in the woods and the prairies and at the end of the class, everyone says the Friday lab was the best part of the entire course, right? They love um, and are just hungry for that time outdoors learning about, um, you know, learning about what's around them. And, and they say, I'm never going to look at the forest and these trees the same way again, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I, I think there really is a, a great desire out there from the students. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Um, that sounds like a, a great lab lab course to get to take. Um, Bailey asks, um, in thinking about the new chapter that's focused around conservation and preservation of our natural resources, how did you decide on the topics that you included and what is your favorite conservation success story? 
maybe hear from all three of you if we can. Yeah, the conservation and restoration isn't a new chapter. It's a new part of every biome chapter. So every biome chapter, prairies, both forest chapters, uh, wetlands, lakes, and rivers each have a, sort of a new major chunk at the end which is a sort of a conservation history status and trends and what's going on in restoration. So what that means is we didn't have to make too many tough choices um, because for each biome, we could really tailor it to the kinds of, you know, stories that were most important um, for, you know, for that part of the state. So, um, but while I'm talking, I'll just say probably, um, Probably my favorite stories really do have with the have to do with the two pieces of policy in Minnesota that passed because of popular votes by the by the citizens of Minnesota. Um, that's a really big thing to get um, get voter approval, and and we did it in 1988 and 20 years later in 2008, and the results have been you know profound in terms of the 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 amount of opportunity we have to do good things. Thanks, Rebecca, John. And I'll, I'll touch on that too, and especially the 2008 with the with the, the legacy funds. And I've been a great user of those through my work at Three Rivers. And we've done a lot of habitat restoration work. It's not on landscape scale per se, um, but we've done a lot, of, a lot of prairie work, a lot of reforestations. We've worked with restoring animals. So we've been restored populations of, we were the early workings with trumpeter swans. We've done bull snakes. Now we're working on butterflies. So we're, we're trying to rebuild some of the different, some of the different ecosystems. And, and if anybody talks to me with more than, you know, 10 minutes, I'm gonna send you to Crowhassen Park Reserve out in Hennepin County, um, because it is a really cool restored prairie that has been worked on for 50 years. So it has been an ongoing thing, but I think, you know, the, for every acre we are restoring, there is that acre and a half or two acres that is getting tilled or made into subdivisions. I was looking at a map today of areas of Hennepin County and 200 unit subdivisions, I didn't even realize were even in the ground yet are popping up. So it's, it's hard to, you, know, you try to stay positive, but you know, there are good, good conservation programs. And I think the legacy fund has been tremendous over the last 12 years now. Rebecca, do you have a um, favorite conservation success story related to Minnesota? I'm not sure that I would share a conservation success story. I think one of the conservation directions that I am most hopeful about is just the increased um, focus and thought going into the climate change impacts and how we can um, work with ecosystems to support them as uh, the climate changes and just seeing the increasing focus across lots of different agencies um, on that topic for me is heartening uh, to see. Thank you all. Um, we have just a few more minutes for audience questions. Um, and I've got one that goes in the direction of plants. And um, Dean is curious to know what information you might have added to plant communities within the biomes. Well, you know, because of the awesomeness of the Minnesota County Biological Survey at our fingertips, we had, you know, really reliable information that we could uh, lean on. And, you know, we know those systems, the three of us know a lot about ecosystems, but, you know, there's just a one step up when you've got a comprehensive survey of the state that has all this rich detail of plant communities. And so that put us in a really good position to add a little bit more detail to all of the sort of descriptive plant lists and include some of the subdominance. Um, you know, with uh, a lot of confidence that those were really reflecting, um, you know, the examples of the ecosystems that we were talking about. So, um, you know, the plant lists are filled out a little bit more, I would say, with uh, more species that, um, that are just the big ones that make up all the cover. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Eric that says, uh, or asks, what changes in the state between the first edition and the second edition 
would you not have anticipated back when the first edition was published? I'm going to let those of you who've been working in Minnesota longer than me answer that question. <laughs> let, me, let me chime in with one and, um, and just to be quick, I don't think I would have expected the number of invasive species that have moved in and called Minnesota home. You know, John was able to cover them as, you know, in the narrative. And when I did aquatic invasive species, not just because I was directing a center, I was actually caught off guard, even though I was directing that center, that I actually had to put a table together. Um, mm -hmm. And so the numbers of species that moved in and called Minnesota home uh, in the past 25 years, I, I think uh, I, I wouldn't have predicted. I guess if I had one, it would be the ability of native insects to become major invasive insects of sorts. And the example is the Eastern larch beetle that feeds on tamarack. And it's tied into, you know, the fact that temperatures warmed up just a little bit, it's allowed this beetle to kind of run rampant and it's eat, killing the majority of the tamaracks in the state, similar to the pine beetle in the Western United States, which if things warm up is gonna make it to Minnesota and affect a lot of our pine forests. But it's the, the, the quick, the rapid decline, I guess, of the tamarack because of that slight change in our temperatures. Okay, thank you. All right, here's a, a great question um, related to the, the reference library. And I think we all agree that, that this book um, is a, a critical part of our, our reference uh, library about the ecology of Minnesota. But the question is, in addition to this book, could you each suggest another book for the Minnesota Reference Desk that you said this book should be a part of? Well, I would suggest Mark Seeley's book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Mark, can you give us the appropriate title? Well, that's very kind, Sue. <laughs> I've done two editions. The, the most recent edition is the second edition by Minnesota Historical Society Press and still widely available, uh, Minnesota Weather Almanac. And, and like your book, the last chapter of the Minnesota Weather Almanac deals with all the changes going on in our state relative to the atmosphere and the climate of our state. And um, it's, uh, it's very disturbing, uh, as any of you would say, I'm sure, I've spent in total time now, I've spent nearly 50 years of my 73 year old life in atmospheric and climate science. And I never, never would have guessed that I would see the pace of climate change in Minnesota accelerate so dramatically. That's what's so startling to me. It just, uh, I, I, I told numerous uh, citizen groups around the state I'm a data person, uh, and uh, the data, especially the last 20 years of my career at the university, the data were just literally screaming at me. Uh, they were changing so dramatically, not only in terms of our state's seasonality, which of course the seasonality aspects affects all the biology, both terrestrial and aquatic that your book deals with, but also the extremes and the huge impact that the change in extremes has. And so this is what makes me most nervous, quite frankly. And uh, somebody other than me is gonna have to come along in five or 10 years and rewrite the Minnesota Weather Almanac because the pace of change is gonna go on unabated. And we're gonna have to stop and freeze frame that and describe it as best we can at that time. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sue. Mark, we, we put um, a link to the Minnesota Weather Almanac in the, the chat so people can, can take a look at that. John, were you gonna It, it, it kind of depends on what you're interested in. There are you know, hundreds of really good books, but there's a major book on trees in Minnesota. There's a new bird book. There's the reptile amphibian book that I'm kind of a fan of. Um, you know, so it depends on your topic. There, and actually, a lot of them are through the university press. There's 
there's another major bird book coming out next year. So, I mean, it depends on what your interest is. I mean, it, you know, if you're, if you're like me, who unfortunately is interested in everything, it gets to be a, a big collection of books, but there's, there's, you know, a tremendous number of things to look at. Denise, I, I would say that I think every one should have the Minnesota Makoche Land of the Dakota by Bruce White and Gwen Westerman on their bookshelf. I think that that book is really important in us recognizing our history and our present and um, working towards uh, change and, and reparations in terms of our relationships there. So that's a book that I would recommend very strongly to everyone to include in their bookshelf. Absolutely, it's certainly part of mine. And um, again, we put a link to that book um, in the chat. Um, and thank you all for those, those recommendations. Mark, I think I'm gonna hand it um, back to you for to moderate the, the final question uh, for this evening. Okay, thank you, Denise. Uh, and thanks to all participating tonight, especially those that submitted questions. Um, my final question for each, each of you is related to chapter 10, the future. Uh, many of the um, subsections of that chapter are, uh, you could probably write whole books about, uh, feeding a growing human population sustain, uh, sustainably, uh, reversing the spread of invasive species, uh, reducing damaging chemicals in the environment, and the list goes on and on. But it provokes me to ask, um, what do you, what in, in your mind, based on all the work you put into this and based on your career in uh, science so far, what would you say is the biggest concern you have about Minnesota's natural resources as we migrate here into the future? You want to lead off with that, Rebecca? Well, I, I mean, I'm biased by the work that I do, but for me, climate change and coping with climate change and the impacts of climate change, to me, seem like one of the really grand challenges of our time. And I think that that layered on all of the other stressors is is something that is concerning. And I would echo your comment, Mark, about the extremes, because I think one of the things with climate change is we tend to think, well, it's warming. So let's just think about kind of how we support shifts in, in species or biomes or whatnot. But even though it's warming, we still have huge fluctuations and polar vortex years. And, and I, I'm worried about, um, and think that it's a real challenge to be thinking about climate change in that kind of holistic, both directional change, but also increases in, in these extremes and fluctuations. And um, really, I think that's a challenge um, that cuts across all the other issues and, and, um, and links to all the, the, the other stressors that are uh, facing our natural resources and our ecosystems. Sure, sure. Yeah, I worry about that a lot. Uh, what, what, what about you, John? What do you think? Um, look at it a couple ways from a environmental, you know, a environment and conservation end. It's climate change, but tying that in with invasive species. I mean, we're dealing with newer and more aggressive species every year and we can't get ahead of them um, anymore. And then when you start mixing, you know, the plants that people are used to and throw in earthworms or, you know, some of the new be invasive beetles that are coming in, you just can't get ahead of it. So to me, that's gonna make it really hard for us to maintain. But then from the human side, once again, as we talked with our elected officials, you know, they're upset that we were trying to sell electric cars in Minnesota when everybody wants pickup trucks. Well, you don't all need pickup trucks. Um, and we need to start looking long-term for us as a, a state instead of short-term for me as an individual. 
And to me, that's that's a hard sell, especially in our our current political climate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sue, you get the last word here. <laughs> well, you know, this is an interesting one. There's so many ways to go on this one. Um, but I'm going to relate a conversation I had with John Tester as we were beginning the future chapter, and I was trying to you know, take the first crack at scoping it out. And I went over to his house one afternoon with a list of questions, you know, just asking him lots of getting his brainstorming kind of one on one on, on his thoughts of of the future and what he was making of the changes he had seen throughout his career. And, and he remarked that one of the things that worried him deeply is that we just don't talk to each other uh, as much anymore. We, we have lost the ability in many ways to speak across differences. And, and that's so essential, you know, was our conversation and being able to uh, really cut through the toughest challenges that we face. You know, some of the questions that we didn't exactly get to tonight were things like what to do about, you know, agriculture uh, and that sort of, you know, growing land base in the state uh, when it runs into conservation aims, what to do about contaminants of emerging concern uh, and so forth. And all of those things require um, that people who have very different perspectives are able to sit down and talk it through and, and actually use the political process to come up with things that are actions that are collective and are big enough that we can move the needle in a way that is, you know, statewide in scope, like the traditions that we've had in the state, you know, for the past decades, um, whether it be the Wetland Conservation Act or some of the, the, the popular vote um, acts that we talked about tonight, those all required uh, people working together who initially had very different opinions on, on things. And so we, we need to hang on tight to the, the values that have been common to Minnesotans that, that our natural heritage is important to us and to, um, and, and to work across that. And I think that's one of my biggest concerns um, that, we, that might be slipping away and we've got to figure out a way to get that back. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, before I sign, sign it back to you, Denise, I just wanna say how much I admire the three of you for investing so much time and effort into this book. And I think that for your professional legacies, this book is gonna be very significant. And uh, I hope you'll take great pride in, in that fact. And that it may in fact amplify what Sue was saying. This is the type of book that could be a bond among all of us. If everybody would take a look at this book and think about what the state of Minnesota means to them in the context of this book and have a dialogue about it, it would be absolutely wonderful. So anyway, with that, I thank you for making the evening so insightful and informative. And uh, I'll turn it over back to you, Denise. Thank you. And I second that. Um, thank you, Rebecca and John and Sue. Um, thank you, Mark. And of course, thank, uh, thank you to all of, um, all of the participants this evening. Um, thank you for your questions and for the opportunity for great conversation. Um, I hope at home you will um, join me in giving our panelists a warm round of virtual applause. Um, I also want to thank our colleagues at the University of Minnesota Press, particularly Heather Skinner, um, we are grateful for your partnership on, on this event and for, for many other types of um, collaborations that we have with you. Um, and I again want to thank you for joining us tonight. And lastly, please know that the Bell's free virtual programs are made possible through the generous support of donors um, like you. So please consider making a gift of any size by visiting our website and clicking join and give at the top of the page. Um, thank you again very much for being with us this evening and have a great evening.